Uh, welcome, everyone. I guess in the interest of time, I'll get, I'll get started. And uh, this is quite a large topic to cover. So without further ado, these are my disclosures. And just a brief uh, 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 blurb about the RPVI. Um, you probably didn't see that designation before after my name, but this is actually the very first certification I, I uh, achieved even before uh, achieving an um, internal medicine um, board certification. And this is an exam that's administered by the um, ARD, um, ARDMS, not ARMDS, and now by the APCA. This is actually a requirement for, for vascular surgeons um, uh, when they go through their training as of 2014. For those of you who are not familiar with APCA, this is the that administers not only the, vas the vascular uh, certification exam, but also uh, the nuclear boards and the CT boards, card cardiac CT boards. So things I'll be covering in this uh, lecture, uh, I'll go over some common peripheral vascular disease entities and the anatomy associated with them. I'll go over a brief review of imaging criteria and classification of such entities, very, very brief. Also talk about the imaging modality for diagnosis and assessment of these entities. What I won't cover are uh, things that were covered in the multimodality imaging lecture on aortic diseases. Uh, I won't go over acute or chronic medical management and the supporting literature because uh, that's a very extensive body in itself. Um, and I won't cover uh, the procedural or surgical management options and surveillance and the supporting literature behind that because that's an entire uh, separate department from cardiology. The vascular surgeons and the vascular services uh, uh, cover that quite well. So in terms of uh, imaging, the, uh, imaging the vasculature, we have uh, quite a few modalities to go off of. It's, it's truly a multimodality endeavor. Uh, first line in all cases is usually the vascular laboratory, uh, which has quite a few toys to play with, and I'll go over those. Uh, but there's also uh, MRA and CTA, and of course the gold standard of fluoroscopic angiography. In terms of the different disease entities, it's best to classify these in terms of their vascular beds. And uh, when I was when I uh, found that I was giving this talk, uh, I, I figured this was going to be quite of a quite a zoo uh, of a collection of diseases. And so trying to go systematically uh, through this uh, uh, was probably the best approach. So I'll cover cerebral arteries, both extracranial and intracranial, extremities, arterial and venous uh, disease entities, and briefly go over abdominal and pelvic uh, um, disease entities as well. So beginning with the cerebral, cerebral arteries, no talk about cerebral arteries is complete without starting off with the supraortic trunk. The supraortic trunk can consist of the uh, um, arch vessels. So usually the, in most patients, uh, that's going to be the right innominate, left common carotid, and left subclavian. But there are anatomic variants, and these become uh, very important, especially uh, for those uh, who are doing vascular planning. In fact, uh, my fellow cardiac MRI fellows know I comment, uh, often comment about the type of uh, uh, aortic arches, um, because this is important when trying to land an endovascular catheter, depending on on the curvature, um, uh, it may be more difficult, especially with a type two and type three, of trying to get to the right innominate and left common carotid. Moving on, there is a nomenclature for the internal carotid artery going all the way up into the head as well. And of course, there's also the circle of Willis, um, which you'll see why I go into just briefly. In terms of the usual sus suspects affecting the uh, uh, cerebral vessels, stroke is often the big entity uh, the big boogeyman that everyone is concerned about. And this, is, uh, this is, can be divided into three different types, ischemic, hemorrhagic, and uh, TIAs. Under the ischemic etio uh, etiology, which covers 87% of uh, different cases, uh, there's large artery atherosclerosis and cardioembolic uh, phenomenon, which cover uh, most, uh, most situations. Uh, this is according to the TOAST guidelines um, published back in the early 2000s. And a no talk about atherosclerosis is complete without talking about the evolution of atherosclerosis. We usually start off with the uh, um, atherogenic lipid particles depositing in the subintimal space, leading to intimal thickening, fatty streaks uh, that then uh, evolve over the course of decades, uh, eventually culminating in vulnerable plaques. And either the vulnerable plaques uh, become very vulnerable and unstable and rupture, causing um, an ACS or stroke event or they uh, can transform and become uh, stabilized. So when we talk about stabilized plaques, we're talking about calcified plaques, and that's why it's commonly recognized that st uh, stabilized plaques are, are ca uh, calcified plaques. There's also another phenomenon that, that's at work here, and that's known as the Glagoff phenomenon. So uh, Glagoff et al. discussed back in the day that uh, 
when a patient is developing atherosclerotic disease, there's positive remodeling, um, outward uh, remodeling of the arterial uh, wall, but with preservation of the arterial lumen. So this is actually preserved in the early stages of atherosclerotic development, and it's only in the late stages that we begin to see the more critical stenosis that are, that are picked up uh, on our arteriograms and have physio uh, hemodynamic consequences. In terms of uh, uh, assessment of the carotids, the first line exam is usually a carotid uh, duplex ultrasound. Yes, I, you, something you probably didn't expect from a cardiac MRI faculty, but uh, yes, the vascular lab remains first line for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, disease entities, and the carotid duplex ultrasound is a good first step in assessing uh, patients with Ruiz, asymptomatic patients with uh, greater than 50% stenosis, and uh, assessing patients who are at high risk uh, with other risk factors and, and symptoms. Okay. And this is according to the extracranial cardiovascular disease guidelines, which were, which were put back uh, out in 2011 or so. Uh, when we do a carotid duplex ultrasound, we begin by looking at the overall structure. And you, you guys have probably heard that we sometimes do carotid IMT. And this is uh, more still in the research phase. Uh, this was uh, in the 2013 preventive guidelines recognized as still needing a bit of development, uh, even though there's quite a plethora of literature, which I'll briefly review. This is an exam where you uh, should meticulously note using a Myers arc uh, uh, and the head angle um, using the probe. Uh, uh, try to get a tuning fork view and be able to get uh, the double line appearance, which, is, which was established back in Pignoli in the 80s um, as corresponding with the intermedia um, uh, thickness on, on cadavers and pathology. This has actually evolved based on a meta-analysis of many, many cohort, um, prospective cohort studies showing that uh, it increases in carotid intimate media thickness is associated with uh, future cardiovascular events. And uh, this was uh, uh, published not that long ago. Uh, but more pointedly, we, when you do this kind of survey, you also look for carotid plaques. And this is actually an area where contrast agents for ultrasound uh, was briefly considered, because uh, sometimes there's question, especially with a, a near wall um, artifacts, uh, whether or not plaque is present. And so uh, uh, contrast ha has been entertained and is still actively being investigated. There is a European consensus known as the Mannheim consensus, which is in its third iteration as of 2011, which establishes that about uh, 1.5 millimeter uh, uh, thickening or uh, greater than 50% or 5 millimeter protrusion is considered uh, consistent with plaque. The uh, peripheral ultrasound lab will also comment on luminal irregularities and also the echogenic uh, nature of the, of the plaques, commenting on whether or not it's hyperechoic, hypoechoic, or heterogeneous. Hyperechoic indicating more stabilized calcified plaque, homogeneous or, or um, uh, isoechogenic being more of the concerning unstable plaques as well. But we recognize that plaque development can be very centric, and so ultrasound is a 2D technology and can, and can miss uh, eccentric plaque. That's why it's important when they do these studies, uh, recognizing that the vessel is three-dimensional in nature, to do a transverse sweep up and down looking for these plaques before they uh, go longitudinal and start doing, doing their um, uh, Doppler flow measurements. Carotid plaque uh, is associated with uh, significant cardiovascular events, and this is shown in multiple, in multiple large cohorts. This is from a, a review article that I, uh, I co-authored with uh, Vijay Nambi looking, uh, looking at these different events. Um, in the MRI world, there was a, a move to, and this is still an active area, of trying to do carotid plaque characterization using the different uh, tissue properties of, uh, um, uh, of carotid plaque in the magnet. And this is actually from a group that uh, Methodist and, uh, and uh, University of Washington used to collaborate uh, with back in the uh, mid-2000s mid or, or, or so, uh, where we actually participated in a trial called the Smart Risk Study. Uh, looking, uh, looking at uh, carotid plaque characterization and trying to identify stuff like plaque, uh, intimal hyperplasia, and of course the um, uh, lipid-rich uh, cores as well. But of course, uh, the most concerning thing is when this, the plaques do grow and develop a hemodynamic consequences, and then how do we grade these? This used to be contentious, but then with the NASCET, uh, the North American uh, Carotid Endoarterectomy um, uh, Study, um, uh, on, on, on a carotid stenosis, uh, that method won out, and that's uh, what, we, what we use to, to grade our different uh, uh, plaque characteristics. This led to uh, Eugene Stradness, uh, Dr. Stradness in University of Washington, developing the early 
um, uh, protocols based on the, uh, the data showing that uh, 70 to 99 percent had the greatest uh, benefit from carotid, uh, from CEAs in and, and patients who are symptomatic. And uh, there were some benefits still seen in intermediate lesions, uh, 50 to 69 percent as well, based on number needed to treat. Um, in terms of grading these stenosis, uh, there was work back in the 1970s showing that with increasing uh, uh, stenosis, uh, decreasing uh, diameter going from right to left, there is increase in, in uh, peak systolic flow up to a point where then it becomes obliterated. Flow also um, uh, corresponds with a decrease at that point. This is the early criteria that was developed by Dr. Strandness um, and the University of Washington group, uh, showing that we could grade the different uh, levels uh, 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 grades of stenosis uh, based on a peak systolic velocity and spe uh, special characteristics. And this has evolved uh, with the uh, Society of Radiology a consensus back in the, um, 2003, uh, where we incorporate uh, ratios of, of uh, peak systolic velocities in the internal carotid versus common carotid as well. Okay. Of course, uh, it, this reflects uh, when we can actually see a focal stenosis on the carotids. There may be more distal disease, and that may be ma manifested as, uh, as a complete obliteration of the signal uh, in diastole and a lowering of the peak systolic velocity to the point where you, you develop what's called a Doppler thump or thud as well. <laughs> Moving on, uh, in addition to carotid vessels that feed the brain, there are also two vertebral vessels. And uh, a common scenario that comes up, in fact, we had a patient not that long ago that Fahim and I uh, saw who had a subclavian steel. And so this is a, a patient, uh, these are patients who usually have a pressure difference in the, in the um, uh, brachial artery blood pressures. And uh, usually when they use their arms, they develop arm fatigue. And if they use it enough, they can actually develop the steel phenomenon and develop uh, sink, uh, sinkable events as well. There, um, this is actually well characterized in terms of grades of severity. And you'll notice that with increasing um, uh, subclavian stenosis, there's actually a decrease um, a decrease in systolic uh, velocities uh, to the point where it actually reverses at some point, uh, the uh, vertebral artery notching, if you will. Okay. Moving up into the head, um, Dr. Garamy here does work with transcranial Dopplers, and this is used very much in patients undergoing uh, carotid interventions um, and, and patients in, in whom a cerebral blood, uh, blood perfusion is a concern. And so this is actually a uh, very good technology where uh, if you jack up, the, uh, jack up the energy on the ultrasound probe, you can overcome the acoustic impedance of the skull and get uh, a look at the vessels inside. The best way to think about this is that you have a color M mode that allows you to dial in the different depths uh, of insonation, and then you can, you can do a sample line shown here, uh, which allows you to get then the corresponding spectral Doppler at that particular uh, point. So you can actually communicate uh, using a, a temporal read a uh, temporal site, a uh, post-occipital site, and yes, uh, um, uh, through the uh, periorbital site as well, uh, get interrogations of all the um, vessels of the circle of Willis. Uh, keep in mind that if you do interrogate through the um, orbits, uh, you do want to dial down the energy, otherwise you'll end up cooking the eyeball, and patients are usually not happy about that. Um, there are some unusual suspects that can sometimes be confused as disease. Uh, tortuosity. This is actually very common in the elderly folks. This is actually a common board question for, for people taking any kind of ultrasound uh, and, uh, certification exam, uh, where they'll show a picture like this and then ask, give you a bunch of choices with arrows and ask you uh, which direction the flow is going. So uh, tortuosity can be confused for different di uh, disease states. In fact, uh, one weekend actually got called by the surgeons because there was concern for ICA dissection in a, in a patient we recently did an MRI. And it turns out there was tortuosity uh, uh, that was even commented by our vascular lab. It, was, it wasn't a real dissection. Okay. Of course, if you do dete detect a carotid artery dissection on ultrasound, uh, that's, a, that's a shriek moment where you should then send the patient to the emergency room to get uh, further imaging, such as a CAT scan, to look, uh, look for and rule out uh, aortic dissections as well. There is an entity known as fibromuscular dysplasia, and this uh, has to do with uh, um, uh, dysregulation in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, medial lining in, in the majority of cases. But there have been described uh, intimal uh, compromise as well, and also eccentric uh, wall involvement as well, the ty types one, type two, and type three. This usually involves the uh, internal carotid artery, 
and also can affect the renal arteries and lead to stenotic and, and uh, cerebral events. Okay. Paragangliomas also show up on occasion, and uh, these are uh, pretty easy to pick out on ultrasound um, and also on uh, imaging as well. Moving on to uh, arterial extremities. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, arterial blood supply, and I'll try to uh, ver be very brief in, in this situation. But for those who are not familiar with the leg anatomy, um, our interventional folks are very familiar with the uh, CFA that starts at the inguinal ligament and ends at the bifurcation into the SFA and uh, profunda. And then there's also confusion about the popliteal. It usually uh, starts at the ad um, adductor hiatus when it penetrates through the adductor <laughs> membrane and then terminates when it bifurcates into to the anterior tibial and the tib tibial perennial trunk. In the calf, uh, there's often confusion about the three vessels down there, um, but the best way to orient yourself is that the anterior tibial is, as its name suggests, the most anterior, uh, an anterior uh, arterial vessel. It penetrates through the interosseous membrane between the tibia and fibula and runs as the most lateral vessel. It's paralleled by the peroneal artery underneath, and it has uh, the most medial artery, the posterior tibial, um, uh, on, on the side. Okay. When a stenosis does develop in PAD, um, then we should dash or prompt us if it's a chronic situation to look for collateralization. And uh, the uh, body will figure out some way to get arterial, uh, uh, arterial perfusion to uh, to the different organ systems, and it'll figure out uh, ways through the thoracic and abdominal walls, through uh, uh, using the profunda and superficial system, and also through even pulmonary plantar arches. So if you do see an occlusion, but you see, uh, somehow the patient is usually perfusing somehow, um, it's best to start looking, looking out for collaterals. Okay. Um, tried and true is, and first line is trying to look for the ankle brachial index, and, it, and it's as uh, straightforward as it sounds. The ankle brachial index is uh, taken by, taking the, uh, by obtaining the systolic blood pressure in the right and left arm, taking the highest of one of the two as a de denominator, and also getting the uh, ankle uh, blood pressure in the dorsal pedal and pos or posterior table for each limb and using the highest as a numerator. Everyone agrees that uh, anything less than 0 0.9 is considered uh, uh, evidence of PAD. Anything above 1.4 may be signs of uh, calcific disease or some other process going on. Um, and then there, uh, everyone debates after that uh, what degree of severity uh, uh, PAD a patient has depending on the l uh, low ABIs. Uh, but uh, generally, if you get to 0.5 or 0.4, that's uh, approaching critical limb ischemia territory. If you do get a patient who uh, is borderline, at like 0 0.9 or so, it is a class one indication according to the 2016 PAD guidelines to do exercise ABIs. And yes, they do do exercise ABIs here as well. I won't go into this uh, um, uh, too much, uh, but these are the flow diagrams uh, for, di for diagnosing suspected uh, a PAD or chronic limb ischemia. And as you can see here, ABIs remain the cornerstone in, in both situations uh, for assessing PAD. This is usually coupled with uh, segmental blood pressures. And this is also as medieval as it sounds. And shown here is uh, what we do. We just strap blood pressures uh, cuffs everywhere. So you have to be very good at at uh, uh, coiling these around, otherwise you'll, you'll have a loose blood pressure cuffs every, everywhere and an uh, unhappy, unsweaty patient. In terms of assessing blood pressures, uh, we have two ways of doing that. We can use plethysmography uh, or pulse volume recordings, and that's shown here on the, on the uh, left of the screen. Or you can do Doppler pulse wave uh, recordings as well. Uh, one thing you'll notice about the Doppler pulse wave recordings is that uh, this is triphasic. This is, uh, uh, triphasic waveforms are usually expected in, in uh, a waveform morphology. If you see dampened waveforms and loss of the tri triphasic nature, uh, that's indic indicative of uh, PAD as well. The explanation for the triphasic waveform is the fact that uh, in the aorta, there's actually a, a, a property of the aorta, if you will, where when, the, uh, when each uh, pulse is delivered into the into the aorta with, uh, with systole, there's actually an initial pressure wave that goes antegrade, and as it hits the high resistance vascular beds, it bounces back, much like a ball bounces off, uh, a tennis ball bounces off of a wall um, and, and gets reflected. This is believed to augment uh, coronary blood flow um, in, in younger folks, and uh, in disease aortas, the transmission occurs faster and occurs earlier in systole, 
and uh, resulting in less augmentation of uh, coronary blood flow. And one potential explanation of why we see coronary disease uh, in, in, in older individuals as well. Okay. Other toys that the, uh, that the vascular lab has to play with uh, include uh, uh, looking at uh, laser Doppler uh, for uh, skin perfusion pressures. And uh, so that's one way for them to assess for signs of poor perfusion. Um, the, and they can also do oxygen tension as well using, using uh, silver platinum um, electrodes that can actually pick up oxygen coming off the, off the skin as well. In terms of uh, whether or not uh, uh, whether or not there's steno uh, stenosis, then this is usually coupled, coupled with an arterial duplex, and uh, I won't belabor the point here. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, there's a pretty extensive criteria on how to grade that as well. Okay. Uh, of course, in terms of trying to localize the lesion and do procedural planning, uh, then these patients often go uh, go on to get some kind of uh, contrast-enhanced study and CT and MRI. The principle is the same: you inject a bolus of contrast. And, and there's usually a, a multiple phases. There's an arterial phase and a venous phase. And usually we try to target the arterial phase for arterial diseases and venous phase for venous diseases. For, for CT, that's usually iodine-based. For MRI, that's usually gadolinium-based. But if the patient can't get gadolinium because of issues with uh, renal function, that doesn't stop us any, anymore. We do use ferahim, uh, ferramoxetol, which is an iron-based uh, agent that uh, allows us to shorten the T1 and do vascular imaging as, as well. Pro so provided they don't have iron, uh, evidence of iron overload, we can use ferroheme to do this as well. Shown here is an example uh, that's part of our common cardiac protocol. Where we uh, can capture images in the arterial phase, and you can sh show, see here uh, uh, slices and MIPS of the arterial phase, and then we capture again in the venous phase, uh, showing, uh, showing the uh, venous uh, flow as well. And this allows us to grade uh, stenosis pretty well. Comparing sensitivity and specificity against the gold standard of arteriography, we find that ABI is actually pretty, pretty predictive of the presence of PAD, and CTA and CE, uh, contrast-enhanced uh, MRA, is also, uh, is also pretty good at picking up uh, lesions. Um, these are based, uh, this is, uh, the CTA and MRI data are based on uh, large meta-analyses. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in terms of extremity assessment, uh, we do other assessment as well. Uh, this is something you hope, uh, hope as an interventional center to come across, hopefully with good pressure and, and technique, but every now and then, um, and good bed rest, but every now and then patients will uh, show up with a, in the vascular ultrasound lab with the uh, yin-yang sign or some uh, call it the Pepsi sign. No, uh, no uh, financial um, conflict there, um, no investment there. Um, but uh, the reason why this is described uh, this way is because you get swirling in the pseudo, in, in pseudo aneurysms of uh, to and fro uh, uh, flow uh, associated with that. There's, uh, there are various uh, also issues uh, with entrapment, with compression, and thoracic outlet syndrome is uh, a described entity uh, where you, either you have an extra cervical rib or some uh, anatomical issue with the clavicle or the scalene muscles that will impede uh, uh, blood flow, so it can affect the arteries, veins, and even the nerves, and some patients will get symptoms with that. So uh, one way to bring it out is in the exam room, do an ASIN maneuver, and this is also used in imaging as well to try to, try to provoke a, um, a stenosis of the subclavian. Similarly, uh, you can also get popliteal entrapment syndrome. For whatever reason, the tendons are arranged uh, in, a, in a configuration in some patients that, that, uh, that trap arteries, veins, and nerves nerves as well, and that can lead to calf ischemia as well. Um, there's a classification scheme for, behind that, and I won't go into that. But uh, this is still an active area of research. There's also endothelial uh, reactivity testing, and that's done through, brachial, through BART, uh, brachial artery reactivity testing, where what they do is they compress the, compress the arm with a blood pressure cuff and then release it, and then 45 to 60 seconds afterwards measure the increase in diameter, and, and then for good measure, um, uh, pump the patient with nitroglycerin uh, to get maximal vasodilation. Okay. Moving on to venous diseases. Uh, the venous is, for every artery that runs through the body, there's a vein that brings blood back. Uh, things to note, especially in the more distal limbs, like the forearm and the calves, there's always two veins flanking the artery. So that's why whenever you see on an arteriogram or, or uh, ultrasound ex exam, uh, a, a calf or a, a forearm ex exam, 
you'll see uh, the three vessels running, uh, running together. So that's usually a pretty good clue, the arteries in the center. This is also why when we do uh, venous assessments in, in patients uh, for PA, uh, uh, going, going back a bit, when we do PAD assessments in, in patients uh, um, uh, on, on, uh, on CTAs or MRAs, I don't like to use the venous phase because the ve two venous vessels will flank the ar artery and obscure, um, obscure the vessel. There's also uh, an extensive val uh, valvular system, both superficial and deep, and um, the importance of which I'm going to go over very briefly. Um, this becomes relevant in chronic venous ins insufficiency, which I'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about venous obstruction and thrombosis, and I'll briefly go over uh, some exotic forms of AVMs. In terms of chronic venous ins insufficiency, everyone has likely encountered uh, varicose veins. So varicose veins is a manifestation of uh, incompetent venous valves. Normally when we walk, um, when we go from sitting to standing, there's an increase in uh, pressure in the legs that's expected. But when we walk and start using our muscles to, to uh, pump blood, that usually drops the pressures and increases venous return. Unfortunately, in patients who have incompetent valves, that can lead to, to leg swelling and uh, complications as well. And so uh, for the most part, it's uh, cosmetic issues, but when it gets to the point where it starts leading to non-healing ulcers and, uh, uh, and edema, then that, that can be a pro uh, become a problem. Uh, at that point, you should refer to the vascular surgeons to help out for either sclerosing therapies or ablation therapies and, and maybe even uh, a wound care to help with, with wound healing. For venous thromboses, um, this is a, a grave concern because of the uh, risk of DVTs and, of course, the sequela of PEs. Vascular ultrasound remains first line for diagnosing this, and this is usually demonstrated by incompressible uh, veins. So veins are very low-pressure systems, uh, so when the uh, sonographer is doing their exam, they'll sweep up and down and use the ultrasound probe to, to squeeze the vessel and demonstrate that it collapses. When you don't see it collapse, that's a concern. They also look at uh, venous Dopplers as well, and so you will lose uh, you'll, you'll lose the respiratory and pulsatile uh, uh, phasic uh, uh, changes that are seen in the venous Dopplers with, with uh, venous thromboses, and, in, and the venous signal may be lost in, in uh, thromboses that are 100% that are, uh, uh, occluding the vessel as well. Shown here is uh, um, an, MR, an MRA um, MIP uh, with a big thrombus in the IVC. Uh, so we do have MRI techniques that allow us to pick up thrombus. We can, of course, do a standard venogram, uh, just like a CT can, but we also have a technique known as TI-600s or TI-1000 if ferrohem is used. So this allows us to allow the entire body to be permeated with contrast, and so the, so the signal is enhanced throughout the entire body, but thrombus tends not to pick up contrast, uh, so it will uh, tend to appear dark on these images. Okay. That being said, Thrombus does evolve over time. So when a thrombus acutely occurs, and this was work done by Valentin Fuster and uh, Zahi Fayyad uh, back in 2002, uh, where they uh, took uh, swine models and, and created thrombus in the veins, and they uh, demonstrated that uh, over time the thrombus actually evolves. Uh, so the hemoglobin content of the blood will actually change uh, from to deoxyhemoglobin state and then to methemoglobin. So when it turns to methemoglobin, the ferric state, 3+, plus, it, it creates a, a bright T1 signal, and so it actually becomes bright when it's one to two weeks old on T1-weighted imaging. Of course, because of the uh, fluid content and all, um, T2-weighted imaging also uh, uh, leads to high signal intensity that gradually goes down. And by the time thrombus has evolved greater than six weeks old, um, it usually becomes iso-intense with the surrounding muscle. Moving on, uh, there are some exotic forms of AVMs. Um, AVMs is uh, one of the feared complications of some procedures uh, as well, but uh, there are some genetic syndromes that lead to capillary uh, uh, AVMs, and this is known as clipal trinalny syndrome. And so this is uh, shown, as, shown as very dramatic uh, uh, um, arterial enhancement in the legs compared to the normal uh, leg shown on the right. This is not to confuse with true AVMs, where there's actually abnormal connections between the arteries and veins in Parks Weber syndrome, um, and that's shown in this case here. Okay. Finally, we're getting to the home stretch, uh, talking about abdominal and pelvic um, uh, disease entities. Abdominal vascular uh, anatomy uh, includes the celiac artery, SMA, and the right and left uh, kidneys as well. There's also uh, the venous system, the renal veins, as well as a portal venous system, uh, which I'll briefly, very, very briefly go into. 
For mesenteric ischemia, there are criteria for assessing this, and this is done by, uh, by ultrasound, of course, which is first line. There's actually protocols as well where you, act, where you feed the uh, patient food um, that you su uh, suspect uh, celiac disease. And to, to describe this, the celiac artery is usually a high resistance, uh, high resistance uh, Doppler waveform. Um, so it tends, it tends to uh, not have diastolic flow as much. But when you feed a patient, uh, there's increased blood flow to the stomach, and there's actually conversion of the high-resistance waveform to a uh, low-resistance waveform, if that makes sense. Um, and so that's, this is used to provoke uh, increased uh, uh, flow in, in uh, patients with suspected mesenteric ischemia to see if there's augmentation of the peak systolic flow. We actually do that in the MRI lab as well with phase contrast imaging uh, to, try to try to provoke a celiac stenotic disease. There's, uh, there's a different phenomenon where the arcuate ligament of the diaphragm can actually trap the celiac artery and lead to, uh, lead to stomach pains as well. And this is uh, the median arcuate ligament syndrome, also known as the celiac compre artery compression syndrome. And this is, uh, something, this is a phenomenon that's actually made worse when the patient expires. So we'll actually, uh, actually uh, do uh, protocols both in the vascular lab and in the MRI lab where we'll have the patient free breathe and try to see if it uh, changes the, uh, the celiac artery, artery configuration as well. Okay. Moving on to the renal arteries. Um, for those of you who are familiar, there are some renal variants. Accessory renal arteries are, are renal arteries that, uh, that uh, all, uh, feed the hilum just like the norm, normal native renal arteries. Uh, but you could also have uh, barrent renal arteries that feed a uh, different part, uh, part of the kidneys as well. So this is something we, we tend to look, look out for. Uh, renal artery stenosis is a grave concern because that's uh, a potential cause of renal, uh, renal vascular hypertension. There are criteria, again, on the, um, on the vascular ultrasound side uh, for assessing this, which I won't go into great detail here, but uh, Dr. Stranis uh, did a lot of work um, on this front as well. Uh, in terms of MRI, we can uh, do, we can do uh, uh, velocity uh, flows as well with phase contrast imaging, but we can also do what's called arterial spin labeling, where we can actually try to uh, map perfusion uh, in, into the kidneys um, using this, this, this technique. So in a way, it's kind of tagging the arterial blood as it's, as it's going into the, into the uh, kidneys, uh, try, to, try to get a better assessment of, of blood flow, of the blood kinetics as well. Okay. I did mention fibromuscular dysplasia, and I won't uh, go into that as, more, as much. Uh, finally, uh, wrapping up with the venous pathology and the abdominal, um, abdominal um, um, uh, compartment. Uh, there, there are different syndromes, such as the pelvic congestion syndrome, compressive syndromes of the veins, and portal venous obstruction. Pelvic congestion syndrome is a syndrome um, described more in women, where they tend to have uh, pelvic pain and fullness. And this is seen, um, uh, this is, uh, uh, seen uh, having to do with the gonadal veins, especially the left gonadal vein, because that, that's affected, that tends to get affected more because the left, if he's into the left renal vein, which then has to uh, transverse and go into the IVC. Okay. Uh, Nutcracker syndrome is an extension of that. So this is a, a phenomenon whereby um, the SMA and the infrarenal abdominal aorta can compress the left renal vein because that's where it courses through. So if you have a sharp angle, um, this can lead to compression, and you'll actually see uh, pre-stenotic dilatation uh, and, and congestion leading to, le leading to uh, uh, pelvic compartment syndrome. It can also lead to left varicose, uh, varicose seals as well. Okay. We do dynamic imaging on MRI to also demonstrate the, the compressibility of the veins by the, by the arteries. Similarly, there's uh, May Turner syndrome, which affects the left iliac vein. And this is actually caused by the right iliac artery. So, so you can actually see on dynamic imaging, the right iliac artery will pulsate and compress the left iliac vein. This leads to left uh, lower extremity edema and pain as well, and can, in, in uh, some circumstances cause left extremity DVTs. So this is another uh, uh, compressive uh, syndrome um, to be aware of. And finally, there's portal hypertension. We don't do as much imaging here um, of that, uh, often, although on occasion we, we get uh, cirrhotic patients getting sent for, for this assessment for portal vein, vein thrombosis. Uh, everything I, s I mentioned before about thrombotic imaging still applies here. Um, in terms of uh, vascular ultrasound uh, assessment, 
there is the issue with uh, uh, the flow pattern in the portal veins. Portal veins usually take blood from the, from, from the bowels and the spleen and return it uh, through the liver. And so when you sample blood flow in the portal veins in the liver, that leads to what's called hepatopetal flow, in other words, flow into the liver. That's opposed to hepatofugal flow, which is flow that's uh, going away from, the, uh, away from the liver. And that's actually seen with a portal hypertension with, with a reversal flow as well. Uh, so hepatic veins, which feed into IPC, have hepatofugal flow, not hepatopetal flow um, in, in normal uh, situations. So that's a quick way to distinguish it on, on, uh, on Doppler exams as well. When we do get these cases, though, it then becomes complicated because uh, then we have to hunt down every single uh, varices that can develop. You can get hemorrhoids, you can get splenorenal varices, you can get splenogastric varices, gastroesophageal varices, and let's just say it's a headache to try to hunt every single one of these down. Okay. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and say, in summary, that imaging assessment of vascular disorders does require knowledge of the regional uh, vascular anatomy and phys physiology, which is pretty extensive, as you can see. The vascular laboratory does remain the first-line modality for assessment of many of these uh, disorders. And so if you do suspect an entity like this, I encourage you to refer to the vascular lab initially. Um, but then once, once you evolve from that and need more further data for like procedural planning, CTA and MRA then become a, a, a pretty good non-invasive exams to, to go forward with that. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? Thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, could you maybe talk about the uh, cases where there is discrepancy between the modalities? For example, carotid disease when there is an abnormal Doppler but normal CT or normal angiography versus cases where there is uh, tight lesion but the Doppler was normal, um, kind of a, um, aside from the, uh, uh, you know, ectasia of the vessels. So that's a good, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, whether uh, um, issues with discrepancies between modalities. So usually with uh, uh, with uh, uh, discrepancies, there's something fundamentally wrong with the technique. So in that case, uh, one has to go back and start looking for uh, issues with the with the uh, it, with the protocol and with the imaging setup. Because uh, as uh, I mentioned before, for example, ultrasound tends to be more of a two-dimensional. Uh, uh, imaging modality and can miss things if not done properly. That's why we usually encourage transverse imaging with, with ultrasound to try to assess with that. Uh, same with CTA and MRI, it tends to be a very highly sensitive and specific uh, when compared to arteriography and tends not to miss as much, but it also depends on uh, um, the reader being systematic and looking uh, looking through through uh, not reconstructed views, trying to look at the raw data and making sure that, for example, if you do like maximal intensity projection, that you're not blooming out the the, the lesion in those situations. I hope that answers your question sufficiently. I read that modality that was uh, quite extensive and tells us also how how complicated you know the arteries and the veins beyond the heart are. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, the question to you, when you say vascular lab, if you have some of these issues, are we talking radiology? Are we talking your lab with uh, Dr. Shaw? Who takes care of the abdominal vasculature? B because it oh, looks a, like there is a, no, I mean, it looks like there is a tailoring of, of the imaging to conceivably the clinical question, and some of them are done with different, positions or respiration. I mean, uh, there are quite a few nuances, I think, that are there. And Absolutely. I mean, if both labs are fine, uh, the question is when, it, when that question comes, which is infrequent, but when that question comes, is um, how do you target um, the question to have an answer? So I had the great luxury, luxury of training in this vascular lab when, when Megan Hodge was still around and, and uh, Dr. Noonan, McC Dr. McCollum. And uh, they actually handle quite a bit. They do extracranial, uh, ex extracranial um, um, uh, uh, vessels, so they definitely look at the carotids uh, and venous structures there. Uh, they also do upper extremity for, for uh, procedural planning for Dr. Peden as well, and lower extremity. Now it becomes contentious with the abdominal side because I understand there's an uneasy truce with the, with the radiology department. 
um, the radiology department actually handles abdominal, uh, abdominal ultrasound assessments, including renal artery and, and uh, uh, abdominal branch vessels as well. So that's the way it's set up in our, in our center, um, but, but, usually, uh, and, uh, but usually it depends on the, on the different centers on, on the agreement between radiology and the vascular lab. Um, is, a, is a short answer I can give you.